Thank you very much. I'd like to talk to you about uh, ecosystem functions on coral reefs. I, I first uh, got into this kind of area in the 1990s when I was invited to a workshop in the Caribbean. And there, Terry Dong was leading a group. And what we were doing is looking at how ecosystems work in terms of the functions. But at this time, people were mainly looking at it as in terms of corals, in terms of framework building, secondary framework builders. And for the things that I was interested in, the fish, they were reduced down to these modifiers or consumers. But I was interested in these in particular because I was one of the few people at that time who had any quantitative evidence of functional groups. I'd been looking at uh, parrotfishes, and I'd seen that within the genus Scarus, there was actually two groups in there that were functionally quite distinct. Some were removing parts of the reef and the others were just removing the algae. And as a consequence of all of this, we were able to come up with a scheme and we looked at the functional groups and we had these uh, basic schemes in terms of scrapers, excavators and browsers, each doing a different thing on the reef and each playing a, a different role. Um, this was well accepted and as a consequence by the 2004, we were able to put together a paper where we described the, the need to look at functions on reefs as a way of looking at the system and, and managing it. And we used these herbivorous groups as the classic example of how, how to look at functions and, uh, and how to understand how reefs are working. The problem with this is that I, I suggested that we should go out and look for these functional groups. And everybody, in a way, said, well, yeah, that's a good idea, but they all seem to look at my functional group. It was a case of I wanted them to go and find their own, but instead they, they found mine and, and they liked it. And I felt very much like Brian uh, in The Life of Brian, <laughs> that everybody seemed to want to follow me, but I didn't quite understand why. So. Um, the problem was that we were left with all these other wonderful fish groups and we have no idea if they're functionally important or not. So we, we're left with a situation where we recognise the need to understand functions but we don't have enough of them in terms of well understood groups. And this leads us to some degree of desperation and we're starting now to look at things like traits. Now traits are something that helps us to get an, an insight into functions and people talk about functional traits and, and we did indeed do it in this paper but the reality is they're not functional traits. Most people when they measure traits choose them because they're simple to measure or even estimate if you don't measure them. The functions aren't the priority. And in fact, in most cases, you measure traits and then you retrofit a function to them afterwards. Now, that's a bit problematic because what we're doing is we're looking at patterns, which is good, but we're not really understanding how the system works. And the other thing that plays into this is that this is a photograph of my PhD site on Lizard Island, and I understood all the functions. These are my fishes. The top fish, I followed it for two years. I know where it ate, where it defecated, all of the things. That, it's like Big Brother, it said. It was me watching. Um, so we know all of the details of these fishes and the functions in that world. The problem is this is the exact same location today. We're living in a different world, we've got different functions, different priorities, and we've got to recalibrate the way we understand our world if we're going to be able to uh, manage it in a, in a useful way for the rest of us. And this is happening throughout, as, as Terry has described in his papers, that we've got bleaching now that is recurring, and as a consequence, the reefs that we're dealing with are going to be a different kind of reef. Now, I was in Samoa in 2000... Oh, sorry. Uh, I'll come on to that later. Um, we, we have these recurring bleachings and, and they're changing the nature of our world. So, if we're going to be dealing with this, we've got different ways of, of dealing with it. Um, and it depends on where we are. So what I want to do is I want to share with you um, a paper. <laughs> it's probably my least popular paper I've ever published, but you look like a friendly audience. <laughs> I can't, can't actually see you, I just say that. Um, and... Well, it's all about this question, can rabbit fishers save the Caribbean? Now, um, the, the, uh, the reason I asked the question is because I wanted to stir the pot. I wanted to think about new futures and how we're going to deal with them. Now, if we think about the Caribbean, this is the Caribbean as it used to be. This is the Caribbean that we'd all like it to be in the future. But for lots of the areas, it looks like this. We have a fair bit of weed, and the seaweeds are, are expanding, the, the macroalgae. So we, we have a bit of a problem, and the reason for this is that humans have eaten many of the large fishes. So we've eaten the herbivorous fishes. There's other reasons as well, but our own consumption is part of the driver of this. And there's another thing that's exacerbating it, and that's the introduction of lionfishes. 
So humans have eaten the big fishes, lionfish are eating the small fishes. We introduced them from the aquarium trade, they've now expanded across the entirety of the Caribbean, and we have a new system over there where we've got problems with maintaining herbivore cover because we're just eating them or the fishes are eating them and the algae are able to proliferate. Across the other side of the Mediterranean, sorry, the other side of the Atlantic in the Mediterranean, there's a kind of a, a mirrored problem. And over there, we have another ecological disaster opening up. What we find on that side is we've got another introduction, but this time it's rabbit fishes. Now, those rabbit fishes are doing the opposite. What they're doing is they're turning the Mediterranean from something like this in Malta, <clears throat> excuse me, where we've got lots of algae and that's a desirable rich place for the people of the Mediterranean, to something like this in Turkey where we've got these deserts where there's nothing left. So what we have in effect is two ecological disasters, one on the left where there's too much algae and one on the right where there's not enough algae. And in my brain, this basically, you know when people have trouble with their guts and they say what you need is a fecal transplant? <laughs> and you change the way your guts function. Well, my brain thought, well, what we need is a functional transplant. We need to take the functions from the Mediterranean and get them in the Caribbean. Now, now you know why it upset people. <laughs> I didn't suggest that we move these rabbit fishes. I suggested these rabbit fishes are gonna move themselves and we're looking at a new world. And we've got to come to terms with this. The problem with this is that that new world and the way it's going to go involves the movement of these things. I suggested that rabbit fishes are going to go into the Caribbean and they're going to change the world as we see it. Everybody were up in arms. They said, look, A, you can't suggest we move them. I didn't. And B, it's not going to happen. Go and read your biogeography lectures, David. Go and read your own papers. You don't hop across the Atlantic. Well, two pieces of information. The first one is, this is a summary of all of the species that have been removed from the Caribbean, that have been introduced from the aquarium trade. In the bottom left-hand corner is this thing hiding, and that is a rabbit fish. So it isn't a case of will rabbit fishes get to the Caribbean, they are already there. These fishes were collected, it hasn't, to our knowledge, established a breeding population, but we don't know. So if you did eDNA, you would find rabbit fish DNA in the Caribbean. So some of them are already there. But what about the ones in the Mediterranean? You say, look, they're, they're there, they're expanding across, and as the warm waters increase in the Mediterranean, there's this inexorable move of these tropical species across the Caribbean, sorry, across the Mediterranean, they're getting closer and closer to the Straits of Gibraltar. Once they plop out into the Atlantic, then they'll hop across, I believe. The thing is, um, everyone says, no, that, that can't happen. However, my little friend here, Chromis limbata, it has a biogeographic distribution like this. It's been there for two million years. It isn't going anywhere. It's trapped on that side of the Atlantic until 2008. And then it decided to hop across the Atlantic and it's now established itself as a breeding population in South America. It is possible. The Caribbean fish fauna today, about a third of the species have done that east to west transition. It's happened in the past, it's happening as we speak, and the rabbit fishes are gonna do it. So that whole scenario is going to be, I'll just, people tell you that winter is coming. <laughs> Rabbit fishes are coming. They've got it slightly wrong. Anyway. So when they arrive, and it's not a case of if, it's when, this is what's going to happen. It's got positives. It's, and what I wanted to suggest is that we shouldn't be frightened of change. We shouldn't avoid it and try and vote ourselves or work ourselves back to the 1930s. We've got to accept a new reality, and the new reality for the Caribbean will include rabbit fishes. And what are they going to do? Well, they'll eat the macroalgae. They have seen lionfishes before, so they're not going to be victims, as many other things are. They can sustain fisheries intense fisheries, and they taste delicious. I've, I've tested them. They don't need corals, which is good because there's not many corals. Um, and they don't buy a road. So it means that the corals are going to be able to survive and not, not get undercut as urchins would do. The negatives, they're not natural. There's unknown interactions. And it's irreversible. But it is already irreversible. We've introduced them to the biogeographic realm. They're not going to leave. This is an inevitability we've got to come to terms with. So when we look to a future of a Caribbean, this is what everyone hopes for, but this is what they're going to get. <laughs> and maybe we've just got to change the way we view the future and start to adopt a, a new attitude towards rabbit fishes. And the truth is, wouldn't it help if they were yellow? 
And, and that's the way humans work. Anyway, so what happens in the Indo-Pacific? That's okay for the Caribbean. What, what is our future? Well, we have a, a different one. We have had these bleaching events, and we've had four major ones on the GBR. And as I said earlier, that in Samoa, in 2003, I was there, and there they talked about the annual bleaching season. So we have these recurrent bleaching events, and what they're leaving us with is coral depauperate reefs. The, the ability of reefs to maintain corals is going to be compromised. The question then is, what alternate states are we going to have? Now, in 2004, Terry and I put together this scheme of all of the alternate states we can get on a reef. The scheme tended to suggest that we were going to go to macroalgae as one of the alternative uh, conditions, and indeed this has happened in a few places in the world, but it's relatively rare. In the vast majority of cases when corals disappear, they don't go to this, they go to this. It's a turf-dominated system. So this is the kind of world we're going to be looking at. In terms of the, the scheme we put forward, well, this is how we looked at it, but we made a couple of uh, errors in there. In terms of one of the main drivers, it's actually sediment, not nutrients, that seems to be particularly important. And the macroalgae in the middle was a little bit of a, an oversight in terms of its emphasis, because the reality should be this. They changed to turf. And the thing is with turfs, that Turfs ain't turfs, there's lots of different kinds of turfs. And what we found is that the sediment gives us different kinds of turfs and we have what in effect we, we label as good turfs and bad turfs, the, the long sediment laden ones are the bad ones. So good turfs, we call them spats, short productive algal turfs. What do they look like? Well, they look like this. Fish like to feed in them, corals can thrive in them. They're the good turfs. This is a bad turf. It's, that's my finger, and it's up to my first knuckle in terms of algae, full of sediment, and nothing wants to eat this. Fish don't like it. It's like sandwiches full of sand. It isn't something that's going to be eaten. And as a consequence, we have problems in terms of the, the way that these turfs work. Now, if we're looking at macroalgae, do we know how to control those? In terms of fishes, yes, we know which fishes we have to protect to get rid of the macroalgae. We've been doing this for 20 years, that's easy. But that was in the old world. What's happening in this new world, do we know the functional groups that are relevant for these turfs? Well, we thought we did, and uh, they're the fishes that produce these marks on glass. So what we did is we, we started to work on this, but recent papers suggested that our assumptions about this fish on the top left-hand corner, this is Tinochetus, is the most abundant nominal herbivore on the barrier reef. It was believed to be a detritivore. In other words, it just removed particulates, didn't remove algae. Recent work said it removed algae. If we got this wrong, we would fundamentally misunderstand how functions worked. So we went back to the drawing board, we checked it with micro CTs, uh, we looked at the structure of the inside, we found that it did remove detritus in terms of the structures, uh, we looked at how it fed and it has this weird way of feeding, it's like a dustpan and brush, and it brushes the sediments off the reef along with the, the particulates. And we found that in uh, the field, it only removes detritus. And experimentally, it doesn't remove algae. So the overwhelming thing is that the original assumptions that were based on Jack Randall's work in the 50s were right. These are detritivores. It was an important thing to do, to go and check our understanding of functions, because without a basic understanding, all of the models that come from that are going to be misleading. So what we did is we looked at it, but we revealed something which was unknown at that time as just how sensitive these fishes are to the sediments. They don't like it. As soon as sediments increase, they stop feeding. Now, what does this mean? Well, we have these functional groups that are dependent on these turfs, but they are also shaped by them. They, they need them, but if there's too much sediment, they're not able to operate. So we have these new kinds of systems where we have turfs. We know the fish can feed on them, but they're sensitive to them. And the question is in all of this, does it matter? It, these are turfs. They're not that exciting. You go diving. This is the thing. When people say, go onto the reef, sit down on the bottom on nothing, the nothing you're sitting on are these turfs. Does it matter if they've got good ones or bad ones? Well, we did an experiment. There's a way to increase the length of the turf. You can either increase the sediment or decrease herbivory. We did both experimentally. And this shows you the difference between caged and non-caged ones in terms of the yield of algae to fishes that feed an algae, basically the thing that drives primary production on reefs. 
a doubling of sediment to what are normal levels, but they're just twice what you get in that exact location, resulted in a 2,000% decrease in algal yield to fishes. So in other words, adding sediment effectively wiped out the algal production that fish could feed on on that location. And most fishes are nitrogen limited. The nitrogen yield to fishes went down by 3,300%. The sediment absolutely categorically wipes out these turfs as being useful for fishes. It's a major change for the way the system is working. Now, that's okay, that's what's happening experimentally. What's happening in the real world? Well, this is Orpheus Island, where we work. Recently, there has been a change. 2006, it looked like that. 2013, it became like this. What had happened, a cyclone had come through and it had dumped a great deal of sediment on the reef. The amount of sediment increased in these turfs by 3,700%. As a consequence, we had a collapse of herbivorous fish feeding. It went by 80 or 90% down, and as a result, the algal length increased by 50%. It was locked into one of these long, sediment-laden algal turfs. It is in that degraded state. The really bad news is that we went up a few months ago, and it is still there six years later. This is a new, locked-in, turf-driven system. That is Orpheus Island. So the barrier reef is changing. It's going from this, this is Lizard Island before the recent bleachings, to something like this. What you're looking at as you see these photographs are turfs. The implications for the fishers is quite serious. Now these fishers do remove the sediment. They can help us to keep reefs clean. They can maintain their own spats, these healthy productive turfs, but not if they're overwhelmed. Orpheus Island was overwhelmed. So what this does is it changes the way we have to think about reefs and the, the future of management. We're no longer managing this. This isn't the barrier reef that we're managing. We have a different system. Our traditional management techniques like marine protected areas in some ways are irrelevant now because sediments aren't going to be influenced by protected areas. What's going to really change the future of reefs is what's happening outside marine protected areas. That's in the areas that are not protected from fishing. And that's in the uh, effects of terrestrial inputs. So the future of reefs is going to depend upon the sediments we put into them and the fishes that we take out of them. And in particular, the way that those fishes interact with those sediments. So we have a new world. The future of the Indo-Pacific reefs are going to depend on sediments, climate change, and fundamentally, our understanding of functions on reefs, we have a choice between one and the other, and that's going to depend on how we interact with the functions on future coral reefs. Thank you very much.